Hi everybody, welcome to the Positive Post in Conversation. I'm Zazie Todd and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague Christy Benson. Hey Christy. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And we have two really incredible guests joining us today because we're joined by Dr. Dan O'Neill and Dr. Rowena Packer, who are here to talk to us about their research and their book on brachycephalic animals. So Dr. Dan O'Neill is a veterinarian with a PhD in veterinary epidemiology. He's associate professor in companion animal epidemiology at the Royal Veterinary College in London. And he co-leads the Vet Compass program as a research tool for a wide range of welfare related studies and as a teaching resource for large numbers of undergraduate and postgraduate projects as well. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for joining us today. And we also got Dr. Rowena Packer, who has a PhD on inherited disorders related to extreme conformation in dogs. She's currently lecturer in companion animal behavior and welfare science at the Royal Veterinary College. Her main research interests are the impact of health on behavior, cognition and welfare, with a focus on chronic inherited diseases in the dog and the knowledge, beliefs and decision making of companion animal owners and how to improve them in line with animal welfare. Welcome, Rowena. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Beth. It's lovely to be here. So you're here because of your research, but also because together Rowena and Dan edited a book called Health and Welfare of Brachycephalic Flat-Faced Companion Animals a complete guide for veterinary and animal professionals. And it's a really important book that covers a lot of incredible information that will help people understand why we're in a crisis with brachycephalic dogs. And it has lots of information about how to help these dogs from respiratory issues to dentistry with contributions from experts across many fields. And I'll say, although it has a ton of information in it for vets, it's not just for veterinarians. And I think anyone who is interested in Brachycephalic dogs and the issues that they face, whether you work in a shelter and rescue or it's just something you want to know more about, you're going to find a lot of information in this book. Um, so before we get to the book, though, I just want to acknowledge that my own dog is brachycephalic. So it's kind of the elephant in the room otherwise. <laughs> so just so you know, I do have a Shih Tzu. He was a senior when I adopted him. I do see some of those issues that you write about in your book in him. He's not got a particularly extreme confirmation, but certainly in terms of breathing issues and so on, I do see some of it in him and it's heartbreaking when you see it. So um, I kind of feel like I have a personal connection to this topic now that I never expected I would have. It's just that that's how things turned <laughs> out. Um, so let's start with some basic. Can I, can I butt in there, Zizi? You can. So given, given that it is Shih Tzus you're interested in, and given that the whole background of the work I do at the Royal Veterinary College with Rowena is on Vet Compass, we actually have a study on Shih Tzus currently under review with Rowena and me and some other authors. So, um, and actually, it doesn't show the Shih Tzu has been too bad. Um, Good. So they the the oh, so they, they they come out as a nice little dog, seven point nine kilos, medium body weight. So they're 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 like really portable, beautiful little dogs for most people who want a portable pet. Um, their overall lifespan is, was twelve point seven years, and that's a little bit longer than the average of dogs overall. So if we were to take lifespan as a metric of overall health, it, the Shih Tzu actually isn't doing too badly. Uh, the one area where, and you might have been able to predict this, where they don't do so well as their eyes do. Um, and they have much, much, much higher levels of corneal ulcers. So these are sores on the front of their eye. So 3.5% of them every year get that, really painful. So if we were to do something with the Shih Tzu, it would just be to give them a nose. And by giving them a nose, you suck out the jaw. That means that the eye socket will get sucked back in again, and their eyes will sit back into their skull. So it really wouldn't take much to make the Shih Tzu a typical dog that everybody could go out and recommend. So I'm not sure if that helps or hinders your love <laughs> of your dog. I'm sure your individual dog is absolutely beautiful, but um, overall, not too bad, except for their eyes. That's good to know. And he is he is um, so he he is very portable, as you say. He actually likes to be carried. He's a very, very sweet little dog. It's really when it's hot 
that he struggles and it does get very hot here sometimes in the summer so that's when he finds it hardest but apart from that obviously he's 12 already so he's 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 doing he's very well. doing very well yes okay so let's go back right to the beginning though and talk about what we mean uh, by brachycephaly and which dog breeds are affected apart from shih tzus and i'm going to throw this one to rowena <laughs> first <laughs> So it's a really good question because we talk about brachy, brachycephaly all the time and we it's become quite a well-known, I think, colloquial word now. Um, we often will then follow it with flat-faced, but even that's a contentious term for some people if they're not perfectly flat. But we're basically talking about dogs who their skull is generally wider than it's long. Um, there's different metrics to measure it. My own work previously has looked at the length of the muzzle in comparison to the cranium. So we've got some bony landmarks we can use in dogs to use as, um, to calculate me metrics, to look at how flat the face is, as Dan mentioned, how pushed in or pulled out that jaw is. And it includes dozens of breeds, actually, when we look at it at a broad level, both purebred and crossbred dogs. But we often hone in quite a lot on what we call our extreme brachycephalics. So these would be the kind of poster children of this would be English Bulldogs, French Bulldogs and Pugs. But that's often just based on their popularity that we talk about them. There are some equally extreme brachycephalic dogs out there thinking of breeds like the Pekingese, um, the Japanese Chin, some breeds that almost have faces that are concave. So it's quite a wide range, depending on what our limits for brachycephaly is. And of course, as with all areas of science, nobody entirely agrees. So where we put that cut off um, can vary, for example, between studies. I think the key thing is we're just explicit with what we think, um, what we define brachycephaly to be in a particular uh, study population, for example, as Dan mentioned, when we're working in Vet Compass. So when we think about um, dogs who are brachycephalic, like as far as like sort of being a member of the public, a big thing that we get hammered with and which I think is really important is the breathing issues. Um, and I, I think this and I think of like dogs who have been in my basic obedience classes, like dogs who are obviously brachycephalic in my obedience classes, and they have that typical way of breathing, like the sound that they breathe and they often are panting. And I used to think it was cute, you know, at some point in my life, I remember being like, oh, you know, like that. And now I hear it and I do, I just cringe when I hear that. It makes me like, it's actually upsetting, you know, like you get a little bit of knowledge and it's actually upsetting. So what, what breathing issues do brachycephalic dogs have? What are we talking about here? So I need a core part of that. I was trying to conceptualize it as um, brachycephaly, brachycephaly, so breeding for flatter faces, basically creates an obstacle course for air to get from the outside world into these dogs' lungs because breeding for that extreme face shape is basically anatomically not compatible with functional physiology, like the basics of being able to breathe and get oxygen into your lungs to stay alive, <laughs> the very basics of life. So when we think about that jaw being much shorter and that muzzle um, being so for short. And there's a lot of flesh in our mouths. I always get people to do some weird facial expressions now. So thinking about your tongue, <laughs> your cheeks, your soft palate. So you do that weird face when you lick the roof of your mouth until you get to the soft bit after your hard palate. All of that is very fleshy. And in dogs' mouths, th th those same structures are there, but in a much smaller space in brackets like dogs. So everything's kind of crushed and concertinaed in to a much smaller box, obviously a very hard bony box when we're thinking about the skull, which means that, for example, the soft palate at the back becomes fleshy and redundant almost because it gets sucked down into the larynx. So where we should have a nice big black train tunnel of a hole down into these dogs, down to their lungs. Instead, we've got things getting in the way. So we've got their palate hanging down, which causes that noise that you've just made, Christy, the, the kind of rasping is the vibration of this soft tissue. It's not just the noise, obviously with each breath, they're then having that palate sucked into their larynx, which obstructs and means there's less air actually getting into their lungs. Because that causes a lot of negative pressure in the dog's airway, over time, more of the soft fleshy structures become unstable. So for example, we end up with their larynx, we get these little laryngeal saccules in their throat pop out. So another level of obstruction. We also think about things like their tongue. People love the big hanging out floppy tongue. But actually, again, this is what we call in humans macroglossia. They've got a tongue that's too big for their mouth. I was horrified last year seeing the first Paw Patrol film that they made a joke out of their bulldog friend, R Rubble, having a tongue that he couldn't fit in his mouth as a joke. Oh, he's a bulldog. He can't get his tongue in his mouth. And he thought, 
please don't get this to children and normalize this from that age but everything can't fit in which means that breathing is just so much more difficult the other core feature that we see is very narrowed nostrils often from birth or soon after birth and again the good old trained on analogy i love dogs nostrils i spent far too many hours in my phd picture photographing and measuring dogs nostrils i have a very odd gallery on my on my computer somewhere of them but they should be two huge tunnels again it should be really easy uh for the dogs uh the dogs to breathe for air to get in and out they should be able to open and close you know there should be movement to nostrils but instead we've got often these very dry crusty fixed nostrils where the cartilages are completely closed for some dogs there's not any air getting in whatsoever so it's basically making life very difficult for them to get just a basic breath and i think the core thing to think about with breathing is we're breathing constantly day and night to stay alive so every aspect of their life both waking and sleeping is impacted by having that impaired breathing mm. yeah so that's obviously a real welfare issue for these dogs dan what does your research say about breathing and other medical issues in brachycephalic dogs oh golly this is where the <laughs> list starts it's, um i mean in essence if we think about it and we go back in evolution 10 million years ago dogs started to be evolved um and dogs now inhabit pretty well every part of the planet yeah so we can have them in temporal areas tropical areas arctic areas but if you go and look at dogs anywhere on this planet whether they're a fox or a dingo or a wolf or a coyote if i came from mars I would recognize them as all being the same. They all kind of look the same. They have the same body proportions. They have a, a longish tail. They have a longish nose. They have sticky up ears. Um, and essentially we have taken this wonderful product of 10 million years of evolution that has been optimized for survival. And in the space of a few hundred years, we have gone and selected for mutations, mutations that would not survive and exist in nature. And we've done it because we can, because we're humans. And uh, some people would call it uh, mankind's greatest genetic experiment, where we took a species, the domestic dog, and we turned it into the single greatest mammalian species for um, diversity in its body shape, morphological diversity. Um, and, and in a way, yes, that's wonderful evidence of what we can do to play with nature. But when you play God, you have to take responsibility for the outcomes. And lots of these breeds that we have are fine, but unfortunately we have gone too far in many cases. And the the, the dogs that we uh, breed with brachycephaly, unfortunately, a lot of them do suffer. Um, the, the Christie's comment earlier was quite interesting where um, initially a lot of people look at these dogs and only see cute. Um, so we look at their, their snoring and their noisy breathing and we see it as cute. And we look at the odd way they walk because of their spinal issues. A lot of them are tailless. That means they've truncated spines. We have selected for morphological uh, mutations in their spines. So their spines are shortened and twisted. They can't bend their spines, a lot of those dogs. Um, and we see that as cute. Rowena mentioned about um, that we breathe while we're awake and asleep. Well, a lot of these dogs struggle to sleep. And we find that cute when we look at these dogs trying to sleep sitting up or sleeping with a ball in their mouth or sleeping with their neck on something just to stop themselves from suffocating. And yet we go on YouTube and we see videos of ha ha ha, how funny this is. Look at my little dog waking up every time it tries to sleep. And it is the ultimate in suffering. But the weird thing is it's silent suffering because a dog that's suffering in our world, human world, isn't suffering until we realize it's suffering. And then when you realize it, you can't unrealize it, which I think is Christie's kind of um, sudden awareness moment. When you look at these dogs and realize noisy breathing isn't actually cute or fun, it's suffering. Um, and, and within Vet Compass, we've, we've done studies now on so many other studies um, related to other aspects as well as respiration. So things like cornea and ulcerations, I mentioned earlier about the um, uh, the uh, Shih Tzus, but English Bulldogs have 14 times higher risk of corneal ulceration um, uh, than other dogs. Heat stroke, you had mentioned. English Bulldogs, 14 times higher for heat stroke as well. So in other words, just the inability to 
maintain your body temperature when it starts to get a little bit hot. English Bulldogs, 38 times higher risk of dry eye, just literally where their, their eyelids can't close over their eyeballs, can't distribute tears, and eventually they're not able to produce enough tears. Uh, English Bulldogs, 24 times higher risk of cherry eye. It's like, um, looks like a cherry. It's very well named. A little growth that appears from the inside of your eye. Um, skin fold dermatitis. This is another one, Christy might say, back in the day before her awareness, she might have felt was cute. Lots of people see skin folds as really, really cute. How adorable. Um, well, those skin folds are totally abnormal. They get infected. It means these dogs stink. They have a uh, painful skin, constant lifetime infections. English Bulldogs, 49 times higher odds of skin fold dermatitis than other dogs. And even the ability to give birth. Um, French Bulldogs, 16 times higher probability of difficulty giving birth. So, they, so you could literally go through every single part of the bodies of these dogs and say, we have done something and that something is not an advantage to the dog. And that's what vet compass evidence is, is producing. And it's, it's, it's not a good tale. Um, the beautiful thing is now that we have the evidence, we, the collective we, this isn't about breeders, it's about anyone who decides to, to acquire or to promote. So this includes advertisers and this includes people liking posts on social media. Um, anyone who promotes uh, imagery of uh, dogs with extreme conformations, these extreme body shapes, uh, we can do something about it. We can just stop doing that. I think it's a really important point there, Dan, about the fact that there are problems from head to tail. And I think it's really pertinent to bring up breathing. But I think in part, breathing has become the kind of synonymous thing with brachies or they have trouble breathing, where actually, as you said, there's problems from head to tail. And if it was just breathing, then it would probably be a lot easier to fix them and make them healthier. Where it's almost you've got a list as long as your arm, as your arm of problems that some of which are related to body shape, some of which that aren't the majority are confirmation related. but People are so reticent to change the conformation as the body shape of these dogs that they continue to be lumbered with this extremely long list. So it's where do you start? Where do you then factor in other issues of breeding like genetic diversity, temperament, obviously, you know, behaviour being an important driver of where people want these dogs too. It isn't as simple as, say, a breed that has one or two genetic mutations that can be tested for with gene swabs by motivated breeders and then bred away from this is far more complex and I think this is why we see a range of kind of suggested solutions for brachycephalic breeding from within breed selection so trying to keep the current status quo through to outcrossing through to outright banning and I think that just reflects a lot of the kind of human motivations to either preserve or to start again afresh to a degree so yeah, I think that's partly why this is such a contentious issue. And so you <clears throat> mentioned English Bulldogs, French Bulldogs and Pugs as kind of the poster children of, of this issue. But just so that we're clear for people listening to this, other brachycephalic dogs also will have the same kinds of breathing issues, won't they? So can you give us examples of some of the other brachycephalic dogs that would also have health or welfare issues? Yeah, so absolutely. They, Sorry, carry on, I, I was just going to go from from just to put some numbers, some some breeds and numbers behind that, and then Rowena's whole PhD, her whole existence is about uh, uh, brachycephalic obstructive uh, syndrome. And in fact, the fact that we can name the disorder as brachycephalic, it it just means that when we talk about um, other breeds affected, the fact that the dogs are brachycephalic by definition means that we have moved them away from optimal skull shape. And by definition, they are all affected to some degree. The question is just how far have we moved them away? What other issues come with those breeds? Um, and then those two issues together bring you the numbers. But when we're looking at the, the common breeds with brachycephaly in the, in the overall dog population, the most common ones are not French Bulldogs, Bulldogs and Pugs. Um, the most common ones, the most common uh, brachycephalic breed in the UK is the Chihuahua. Um, and, and second is your breed, Shih Tzu, really, really common. Um, third is a Cavalier King Charles, which is, has just, Rowena might come back to this later, but has just been banned from breeding in Norway um, because of health issues. Then we have the Pug, the French Bulldog, and then we have the Boxer. Um, 
before we hit the British Bulldog or English Bulldog. So there, so there are lots and lots of Brachycephali breeds. In one sense, we do them a disservice when we lump them all in together and call them all Brachycephalic. They have Brachycephali in common, but then each one of them is its own invention. And I use that word uh, with thought because breeds do not exist in nature. There is there is no reason to have breeds. Dogs would just breed together. And we find this in any part of the world where we have street dogs. So it doesn't matter what dogs were released into the into the wild in, the, in those towns, they end up all kind of looking the same. They revert back to the street dog type. Um, so when we when we have breeds, they are an invention, a figment of our imagination. And again, that's one of the huge opportunities because tomorrow we can decide we want to change what we expect a dog to look at, look like. So, you know, they in the UK, I think it might be worldwide now, but they've just stopped making the Ford Fiesta. Yeah, it's been around since the 1970s. It was introduced when there was the oil crisis. They needed a small car. Um, that Ford Fiesta that they stopped producing this year does not look like the Ford Fiesta that was there in the 1970s and 80s and the 90s. It, it, it kept evolving to meet the needs of people buying that car. Somehow with dog breeds, we've done the reverse. We've invented them. So we, it's like inventing that very first Ford Fiesta and then saying, uh uh, this is now fixed in time, bar some minor little changes here and there. This is the way they're going to be. And that really isn't logical for an invention that is meant to fit a purpose in our lives, that purpose is as a pet. Um, so we want a pet, but we want it to live a long life, a happy life, um, to be quite healthy. So for lots of different reasons, including reducing the cost to us from healthcare and including the heartbreak we have when our dog is sick or, and the heartbreak when we lose our dog. But yet the breeds we've invented, we don't allow that to happen. We've just stopped them, fixed them in time. Um, so the so the whole thing is really complex. And one of the big learnings I've had over the past 10, 15 years since I've left veterinary practice and moved into research is the awareness that the, the, the brachycephalic issue, and in fact, the, the whole breed issue, the extreme confirmation issue, is not a dog issue. It's not a problem of dogs. It's a problem of you and me and everyone else, not just who owns dogs, but who, who thinks about dogs, likes dogs, buys products advertised by dogs, is even aware that dogs exist. Um, it's a human issue. Um, Rowena, any further thoughts? No, absolutely. I think, as you say, that is the bottom line of this. And in part, as you say, my initial focus in research around brachycephalic dogs was very much more about biology and the more fundamental risk factors and their welfare. Um, from a very biological perspective, but the more I spent time with um, caregivers, um, including breeders of brachycephalic dogs, the more I thought, actually, no, we really need to be turning our focus onto the human side of this, because we can have all of the kind of risk factor data in the world. We could probably have, you know, more uh, genetic tests. I'm not sure that's the solution here, but we could have more tools for breeders, screening tools, etc., but if people either won't do them or people won't face root causes or face sometimes what is quite an ugly truth around the kind of preferences that we hold as people, then we're not really going to get far. And it's very um, awkward when we talk about these issues at times because there's such deep rooted love for these dogs. Um, obviously, Dan and I are sitting in the UK right now and we sit here with, you know, the English Bulldog is that kind of iconic breed. You know, people are very proud of Bulldogs. <laughs> They're very kind of patriotic as a breed that to talk about them disparagingly will get some people's backs up in a very kind of primal way. Um, so it's just, yeah, a very messy world to wade into. Um, I think Dan and I are going to wed ourselves to it. It's It causes a lot of frustration to work in. Um, but I think, as we can probably go on to in a bit, there's potential, you know, there's potential solutions going forwards. It's just not always the most palatable ones. I thought it was, it's an interesting point that Dan made and I like about the social media, you know, getting advertisers, getting everybody on board with not using these dogs because they really, really just flood our, our, our speeds. Right. Um, and the Academy that Zazie graduated from and that I work for now, we did sign the pledge to not use brachycephalic dogs in extreme confirmation dogs in our sort of stuff, all of our, our public facing social media stuff. Um, 
And it kind of, it, it, when we sort of announced that a number of years ago, it caused a little bit of a stir, even amongst our own graduates and students. Um, and, and these are people who are like really dedicated, who are taking a two year program in positive reinforcement and really care about dog welfare. And, and some of them who, like you said, were really into um, their breeds, you know, or their own dogs, even though they would never, they would never go out and buy a dog like this. Um, there was still some pushback. I got a couple of private messages from people who were like, quite upset you know that we were saying hey we want we want these dogs to be better we want these dogs to feel better and be healthier and we don't want to contribute you know to to dogs that have really poor outcomes and and live you know hard lives like we you know and i thought oh no one could possibly have anything to say about that so it's true people have really strong feelings you know this is it's like a social psychology question almost or human behavior change yeah and that's a, I think that's a lot of where we're starting to go now is the human behavior change side. Uh, we, ha we have the evidence. The evidence is just overwhelming. Um, but the, when you come to, to try to change people's opinions, it's really complex because are we talking, when we talk about a dog, and let's imagine the dog is a French bulldog, what are we actually talking about? And to me, I'm talking about the dog as in the intrinsic being the, the, the creature that thinks, the entity within the dog, whereas for a lot of people, they're talking about the box that this animal lives within. Um, and we get we get conflated with all these different issues. So I will always say up front, I love dogs that are brachycephalic. I also love dogs that are not brachycephalic. So in other words, I love the dog. What I do not love is the box we force that dog to live in. And remember, that's our choice. Everyone who who acquires a brachycephalic dog is an ex is in effect a proxy breeder. We cannot blame breeders for producing these dogs. Anyone who acquires a dog is now making space for another one to be born. You're feeding money into that system. You're encouraging somebody else to produce them. I, I, I wouldn't even say most of these dogs are bred. It's the wrong word. When we think about breeders, we think about the the, the you know the the typical old style breeder breeding some dogs you know maybe to take to a show whatever the majority of these dogs are farmed they are just produced like cattle or sheep they're a product a commodity to be sold there is a lot of money in them especially for the last couple of years there was a lot of money because of the pandemic ruin has done lots of work on this uh, in the uk a lot of them are not even bred in the uk they're bred in southern ireland or eastern europe and imported in legally and illegally so, the, so it, it is just a huge industry um, and uh, full of corruption and the people who are producing them are just producing a product. And it is all of us who continue to acquire and support and promote um, the, the uh, ongoing presence of these breeds that are feeding into that. But, and this is the upside, we can change. So we can say, we we want a English bulldog with a longer nose. We would like an English bulldog to actually have a tail. We would like an English bulldog with a spine that can bend. We would like an English bulldog without all those skin folds. It will be a beautiful animal. It will still be the lovely English bulldog, but it will be able to live a life that's lovely. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Christy. There's this huge complexity here, and it just takes a little bit of shifting of our mindset and I think that's coming. I think the whole new generation, Gen Z or whatever we choose to call the younger people, I think will be much more open minded, much more aware that the dog's experience of its life is as important, if not more important than our experience of, of owning the dog. Uh, up until now, it's all been about us. Doesn't matter if the dog suffers, so long as I enjoy owning this dog that snores and snuffles and and basically is just trying to keep itself alive for how many many years it's on this planet and as you say it's moving away from having all of the kind of onus but also all of the power on breeders not that they're a homogenous group as you say but moving some of that to consumer power because when we think about for example um other animal products if we're thinking about eating meat or dairy consumers can be empowered via saying right we've got various labeling schemes for various welfare assurance schemes internationally in the UK, for example, we have RSPCA, have a big assurance scheme. And we can say to people, well, that there's a way for you to vote with your money for better welfare by buying those products if you choose to buy animal products. 
where I don't think that kind of awareness of being a consumer is so much there within the dog world, that your decision does not just impact you and your family and that puppy or that adult dog, but actually you're buying into a whole system that you can't somehow not be a part of. You know, as you said, Dan, as you buy that puppy, that leaves a gap for another puppy, which could go on for, you know, generations. Um, and just thinking, you know, where where is your puppy's mum where's your puppy's dad like thinking about you know we think about the human family and how dogs become part of our family but how many people know anything about their dog's parentage obviously if it's a rescue you've got a different situation but buying into that support for a system that you're happy about and that you'll talk about you know if somebody says to you tomorrow I'm sure you get a sort of time ah I've got a new dog the thing that rolls off our tongue so naturally is oh what breed is it and again we're not intentionally commoditizing them by saying that but we can we're putting them into these little boxes as if they are products it means that we can think about what they might look like we might have a little bit more of a gist of what kind of behavior they might have to a small degree um but we very rarely ask well, where did you get it from like what steps did you go to ensure good provenance of your dog there isn't that kudos or that stigma of buying badly right now and I say that, you know, but you can buy very badly. Obviously, I think there can be a judgment there because there's ways and means that you can try and reduce your risk of buying from um, really unscrupulous breeders. But I think here, if you say, oh, I've bought a Frenchie, you're probably going to get pretty universal positive feedback that people have got. Well, like, wow, you've got this cute dog. You get that feedback as soon as they've had their, their jabs and you take them out in the park that you kind of get away from it scot-free. Um and I think it kind of links back to that choice of breed or that choice of provenance. So I think there's challenges there, but also potentially opportunities for trying to see how we can change people's behaviour in line with that. And I love how you both keep pointing out that things can change, that there are things that could be done that, you know, will change things, both from the perspective of breeding, but looking at the whole picture of what ordinary people are, are doing as well. And I think that's that's really important. And I think your own research has done such a lot to raise awareness of these issues, both in terms of the health issues and how people acquire dogs as well and how people think of some of these health issues as being normal for the breed when actually it's not normal as you said it's not normal at all to have all of these breathing issues um we only have limited time unfortunately today and i think we could talk to you for literally hours about this so i hope that you will come back and talk to us another time but before we move on to the book section i want to just ask you something about your book and to tell us a bit more about why you put your book together so your book is health and welfare of brachycephalic companion animals and it's it's a wonderful book packed with information i'm going to ask both of you to say something about it starting with dan why did you put this together and and who do you think will benefit from the book yeah, it's a really good question actually and many times while rowena and i were writing it we asked ourselves that question as well so in that, lockdown that, <laughs> yeah well, that, so that book had 21 chapters we tried to cover the entire spectrum all the way from the human side to the evidence side to behavior side veterinary nursing side uh, purchasing international relations um the essentially what we were trying to do was capture the complexity of the issues but also and you you're absolutely right as you try to set out opportunities for change and the opportunities for change that we were trying to flag in that book were threefold number one the, the message from the UK brachycephalic working group which is is stop and think before buying a flat faced dog and that's the core message the idea was to try and share the evidence and then hopefully not so much that we have any right to tell anyone what to do, because until these dogs are banned, and in some countries, as Rowena said, they are being banned, and there are, there are moves towards banning them. They're not banned currently in the UK, but we can ask people to look at the evidence, think about the lives of these dogs, and then you make a welfare-based decision, hopefully. Um, the second thing is to move those dogs towards moderation. And I hadn't I hadn't even crossed my mind until you said the name of the book a minute ago. So we, we called that book The Health. I think it was The Health was the word we used. If I had my time back again, I would probably title it Disorders of rather than Health of, because we really are, are talking about disorders. Um, there isn't even a universal acceptance of a definition of health. We talk about healthy dogs. But health means the absolute ab absence of physical, mental or social 
um, on, on, on health or weakness or harms. That almost never happens. But so whenever we're uh, collecting evidence, we're collecting evidence on disorders. And then from that, we interpret something about health. Um, and on, on those brachycephalic dogs, sadly, it's much easier to, to measure disorders than it is to measure health. Um, and then the third aspect of that book was for the dogs that do exist, and there are lots of them, um, it was to try and provide owners with some um, help and clues and advice on how to look after those dogs. In other words, be aware of the top conditions those dogs have and look after them. Even just being aware of how long they live. You know, a, a Vet Compass paper last year showed that typical dogs, like I said, for your Shih Tzu, should live to about 12 years. French Bulldogs, Bulldogs and Pugs uh, just about make it to seven, seven and a half years. So they're losing a third of their expected lifespan because of the decisions we're making to put them into the box that they will live their life in. Um, and that's, that really was the message from the book, was a very uh, positive one. It used the word crisis earlier. There is a crisis. The crisis is driven by our decisions to suddenly popularize uh, brachycephalic or flat-faced dogs over the last decade. But the upside is we can unpopularize them as well. We can, we can take a decision to buy a dog with good innate health, buy a dog with a muzzle, a tail, a flexible spine, flat skin, a dog that can run, that can exercise, basically a dog that is a dog. Um, and that's that's kind of the core message. Um, Rowena? Yeah, no, in agreement, I think one of my key things when we were first approached about this book was as we talked about at the start, um, was for it to not be a veterinary text specifically. We've got lots and lots of those types of individual siloed texts on, you know, surgery for each individual body part, which I appreciate are extremely important for trying to improve the welfare of those dogs who are in existence. But to broaden out that context, I think coming into this issue as a behaviour and welfare scientist and being slap bang in the middle of a department of vets, it was quite interesting and quite odd at times being like, right, I obviously think about this at times quite differently so it was trying to open up that context open up the stakeholders who are involved because i think it's a huge burden on vets bracky health we've dan and i've recently um submitted a paper about the kind of uh, moral distress that's caused to vets around treating or attempting to treat and care for brachycephalic patients that actually as we've discussed today there's lots of different stakeholders who are involved in terms of causing this crisis, but also who can be involved in the resolution. And I think part of that was trying to open it up to broader animal professionals thinking about this issue with a kind of greater context. So thinking about the history, I think is really key here, as we've talked about today, a lot of these extreme changes have actually been in the last hundred years or so. And I think because of that, we, when we conceptualize it more, it's actually reversible. You know, we've had a blip in dog kind, which has been a really unfortunate blip with much suffering for many animals, but it's reversible through human choice. So I think bringing in some social science to it was really a high motivation for me. And bringing in, you know, this broad group of stakeholders, geneticists, you know, population scientists, epidemiologists, obviously like Dan, historians, and bringing in as much varied research to kind of give that greater context. So it doesn't just become something that's, you know, behind the doors of a vet's office like it was for you know uh, professionals like Dan before he jumped ship into the the dark world of research so that that was my core motivation was to try and get more people to be more aware and more empowered to do something and I and think that's... One, if, I, if I can make one final comment to that in a way almost when we're talking about brachycephaly and because Rowena used the word poster child or poster breed earlier these breeds the media love them because the perception is the public love them, right? Um, but actually, there are lots and lots and lots of dogs of breeds that are innately very healthy. Um, and uh, sadly, we're almost painting a picture of all dogs as sick or all dogs as unhealthy because we have to keep talking about the crisis. But actually, there the, in Vet Compass, we have 800 different dog breeds. Some of these are the old established ones that are recognized by the kennel clubs. Some of, the, some of these are new breeds that we are just inventing, cockapoos, labradoodles, um, cavapoos. So these are breeds just like the old established breeds. They're just newer breeds. Um, and, there, and, and there was lots of evidence to say that these dogs actually are innately very healthy. They have all the bits that a, a dog should have evolutionary wise. They can live a typical life, the 12, 13, 14 year old life. Um, 
And I think we're doing dogdom or dog kind a real bad disservice when we keep promoting certain types of breeds with extreme confirmations on their health issues, um, because dogs themselves can be very healthy, and the majority are. It's just, sadly, there is quite a large minority that aren't. So mm. um, I think there is a long way we can go, but it, it is all of us together that can solve this problem. And I think that's one of the things I love about your book is just how broad it is and how interesting it is to so many different people. Basically, anybody who loves dogs, not just vets at all, um, but anybody who loves dogs or is interested in dog welfare, I think it's a really important book for them to read. Um, and people who work in shelters as well, Pepper's a shelter dog. So, you know, it, it's mm. relevant across, you know, everybody who's interested in dogs. So the health and welfare of brachycephalic flat face companion animals is available from all good bookstores if you want to get a copy and read it I highly recommend it it's very interesting reading and it's illustrated so you get to see pictures of of these issues as well um, so that's great and now it's time for us to move on to the other book section of the podcast so thank you very much for sharing all of this information with us and now we're going to ask you instead to talk about a book that you're reading or have just finished reading uh, and that you would like to share with us so Dan I'm going to go to you first please can you tell us what you've been reading lately Actually, I end up reading lots and lots of books. Um, often I pick them up if I'm traveling or on holidays, but this is the one I'm reading at the moment, which is by Nate Silver, and it's called The Signal and the Noise. You can see from the little tab, I'm about probably just less than halfway through. Um, and to be honest, I found I like these types of books um, that kind of give you a different perspective on the world. They take you outside of the animal welfare, the animal health, the straight epidemiology, and they start to help you see the bigger picture. Essentially, this one is um, talking about the world we now live in. Back in the day, you know, prehistoric Neolithic man lived in small communities. We had relatively few people. We had to remember their names. We had relatively small amounts of information we had to remember. And that's what our brains evolved to deal with. And then time went by, larger communities. The um, Gutenberg invented the printing press. We then have more and more advertisements. We have radio, we have TV, and then we have the internet. And suddenly we are awash with information. So it's all noise, noise, noise. And oddly, even though people talk about the information revolution and information technology, it's almost as though more information, stuff coming into our brains means we're cleverer, but actually most of it is just noise. And the trick, and that's what this book is about, is trying to um, pick out the signal, the key stuff, the truth from all the noise. When you go through all of this reading and then you, you, you can almost then come back to your own world and your own work. And that's what I see I'm doing, say, within VetCompass, we have 28 million companion animals in the UK within the database huge amounts of noise, 800 million treatments, 250 million clinical notes, huge amounts of noise. But the research we're doing is trying to go into that and pull out the signals in the in the, the most of the cases I'm interested in. I'm interested in breed effects. Um, and a lot of the studies I'm doing, I'm reporting which breeds are protected to diseases. So positive effects. This isn't all about negative stuff. Um, so so not sure if any of your um, listeners are interested in that side of um, exploring the world, but I would highly recommend this book. I think it's fascinating. Thank you. That sounds like a really interesting read uh, with lots of good lessons in it, too. Thank you very much. And Rowena, what are you reading at the moment? Well, I'm, I lie when I say I'm reading because I have a very poor attention span. So reading is not my forte, but listening is because I spend lots of time on things like the school run or going to visit parents or being in the car so audible <laughs> I'm allowed to say the name is my best friend I spend my entire life listening to audiobooks and have smashed more books in the last couple of years since deciding that that would be a little bit of self-care than I could have ever read so like Dan we sound very dry look at us both of our non-fiction I'm currently re-listening well I say re-listening I'm just going to come up on the street it's not going to work is it I'm listening to Nudge, the final edition. So Nudge is a very well-known book in that kind of behavioural, economic, social science space. And I didn't realise that post-pandemic, the authors had written a new version with updated chapters on lots of different 
elements, including things around the pandemic, that was clearly um, pretty uh, good uh, fodder for that kind of book. <laughs> but generally a really interesting book around our kind of bizarre decision making as human beings versus a more predictable type of uh, human. And I find that really interesting, again, that, as Dan said, when you can bring in analogies to your own work. So a lot of this book talks about things like choice architecture and how we um, as individuals often are choice architects when we offer different, for example, products or services. And it really it just, you know, it's one of those things that makes you reflect where Dan and I often spend a lot of time kind of lamenting people's decisions around which animals they choose. You know, obviously, as we talked about this evening, it's tough um, when people are making decisions that we would think are not the ideal ones for animal welfare. But I think the more that we think about these kind of complex decisions, the more we have to have a bit of empathy for people, because we're obviously all very much dog people here. But most of the public aren't. You know, there's a huge proportion of first time dog owners who come to the puppy market or the rescue world every year and are faced with an absolute sea of choice. And when we think about kind of choice architecture and if they're faced with, as Dan said, several hundred breeds, which one do I choose? How do they make those decisions? Do they make them rationally at all? But actually, even if they were faced with them rationally, the sheer volume of data around health, behaviour, lifestyle would just, I think, for most people, be completely overwhelming to decide what is the optimal choice for them. So it's been really interesting listening to this book. Again, often, again, focusing on things like the economy, but also the environment. And I think there's huge parallels between some of these issues. You can replace something around choices that impact, for example, climate change, the choices that impact animal welfare. So I've actually really, I'm enjoying re-listening to that, listening to the new chapters. Um, in part, it was because I was previously listening to a rather hideous hypnobirthing book because I'm meant to be giving birth next week. And about probably 20 minutes in, I was like, this is not for me. I'm <laughs> going on a wing and a prayer instead. <laughs> so, <laughs> instead, oh, I'm going to listen to some behavioural economics. So <laughs> that says something about my headspace right now, then interpret all you will. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I didn't actually know there was a new edition of that book. And I think it sounds like a good read, but also a good read to take your mind off things as well. <laughs> so that's good. And hopefully everything will just go swimmingly next week and be nice and easy. Okay. <laughs> um, and thank you for sharing that with us. And Christy, what book have you been reading? <clears throat> so I um, just finished. It's called... Letters, Letters from a Lady Rancher. Rancher. Yeah, by Monica Hopkins. Um, and I actually referenced it in my master's research back in the Paleolithic, um, but I picked it up and read it. Um, so what did it, the premise is it's a, it's true, like it's actual letters, an edited volume of letters that um, a woman wrote um, to her cousin. She was uh, British and we were, before we came on microphone, we were talking about British people moving to Canada. So this is like an early version. Uh, in 1909, this uh, woman moved to Canada to marry um, uh, a man who she'd met very briefly, but then started up like a correspondence with and fell in love with essentially through letters. And it just fascinates me that she would then marry him and they had this long marriage. Um, so she came, he was uh, a horse rancher in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And so she left, you know, what I imagine was like this very British life <laughs> to come and stay in a pretty different environment. Um, she's obviously like for it to become a, a book and something that would keep you throughout all these letters. She was a fantastically interesting person and a good, she captured her world really well, I think, in these letters to her, her I think it was her cousin who she was writing to. Um, so it was neat. I mean, in part, it's a little bit personal because I have family who are British, who moved here around the same time um, to homestead, not ranching, that's a little too richy rich for my peeps, but, um, and then also, I, I mean, the difference, we were talking about this information age, you know, Dan was talking about the book that he's reading being sort of this, like, there's so much of everything, but, but sort of immersing yourself in the experience, and she, she does a good job of making you kind of like, feel what she's feeling, you know, like you suspend disbelief or whatever, of, Imagine instead of like sending an email, you're writing something that goes probably on an animal pulled, you know, vehicle to then get put on a ship to then cross the ocean to Australia, I think her cousin's living in, to then, you know, just imagining it took months for these letters to go back and forth. So trying to 
she's capturing these like moods and happenings and her you know she even talks about what she feeds her dogs you know like just this stuff but just then this acknowledgement that it's going to be months before it gets there and then it's going to be months before you get so when a letter came it was like this really big deal these multiple pages of her cousin writing her back so I just it, it I mean it's really interesting to sort of put yourself out of you know our headspace of today and be like wow this was only a hundred years ago that that you know things were very very different uh so yeah that that's my my book for right now it's good but i think it's it's very albertan <laughs> so if you're, if you're not an albertan i don't know if it would tickle your fancy but <clears throat> I don't know. I might be interested to read about a Brit who came to Canada a whole century before me. That sounds I'm quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm the only person who picked fiction this time. My book is called Bookworm, a novel by Robin Yateman. And so it is about someone who is in an unhappy marriage and her life is rather boring and dull, but she loves to read. And reading is the way that she escapes into the world. And she especially likes to read books in which people come to a sad end or are, are murdered for some reason or another. Um, and then she starts having fantasies about what if some of these books actually came to pass in her life instead. And also she, while she reads them in the coffee shop, she goes there every day to sit and read these books and disappear into these fantasies about things she sees a guy that she quite likes the look of and she's never going to talk to him but she she goes there more often in case she's going to see him more while she's reading her books and then one day he notices her and starts talking to her so her fantasies take on a bit of another turn from the stuff that she's reading in her books um, and what happens to the the husbands that aren't liked in those books um whether this might happen in her life or not so i don't want to give too much away but it's um it's quite a and a fun read um, about what happens if what you what you are reading about actually might come to pass. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So it's it's anyway it's 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 I, I I picked it up because I read about it somewhere and I can't remember what I read, but it it, it was it was surprising and fun to read without giving too much away <laughs> about what happens. Um, so that's what I've been reading, and thank you very much to both of you for coming and talking to us about your book health and welfare of brachycephalic flat-faced companion animals a complete guide for veterinary and animal professions which is available from all good bookstores and for talking to us about your research and about the issues that brachycephalic dogs face as individual breeds with with these these very difficult issues and if people want to know more about you they can obviously go to your websites at the Royal Veterinary College do you have any social media that you would like to share with people I, I tend I, I tend not to use social media to be honest I haven't got the time um and also I think I'm just too old I don't oh, understand it man. um so <laughs> I, I tend to, to to stay off it now Rowena is the other oh, side of me not <laughs> as much but now I've got so much Twitter interest in this just anymore now I want I want this X I know there's been a mass exodus of everybody from there for I'm sure good reasons um, but I am still on there lurking. I'm at Dog's Body RVC. So we've got loads of papers coming out in the next few months, haven't we, Dan? So we're going to be on an absolute uh, dissemination crusade going forward. So I'm sure you'll be really bored of us pretty soon. <laughs> Well, no, that's great. I shall look forward to seeing about those papers and, and reading some of them. And I hope that we can get you both back sometime to talk to us again about these issues and your research. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's been watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please hit the subscribe button to make sure that you always catch future episodes as soon as they're out. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.